Um, unfortunately, my slides are in Dutch uh, because I didn't know that I was supposed to do it in English. Um, but there we go. Um, this is the cover of my new book, which will be presented next month, and um, it deals uh, basically what, uh, with the question what is happening in our information society and where things go awry. And as you can see, there's this little ship that is going down. Probably you know this ship, um, the Titanic. And uh, my basic premise is that we are not yet in ICT, where the, uh, where the sea, um, where sailing was um, after the Titanic. I think we are basically in the age before uh, the uh, Titanic disaster. And let me explain that. First of all, um, I like boats. And this is my boat um, in Amsterdam, having a little bit of fun. And um, uh, I love technology. So I love this lock because um, it closes and it is all maintained from, um, uh, from a large distance. Somewhere in Lelystad, somebody sitting, pressing a couple of buttons. And when everything goes right, a couple of minutes later, you sail out of the lock again and you're like two, me uh, two meters higher. Um, I'll come back to, uh, to that in a second, um, what this has to do with ICT and uh, especially um, with open standards and open source. But let's first make an assessment. The Netherlands is extremely successful in digitizing the world. You see a couple of images here that um, reflect um, what used to be our way of paying, because most of the payments cur currently done um, are done electronically. 99% of all money is digitized. So um, we, d we really don't need it. And next year Amsterdam want wants to be 100% um, fully digital um, using the public transportation card over chip card. And they will not accept um, cash money in buses and etc. Um, in buses and trams anymore because of um, you being way too criminal and robbing the buses all the time. And this is typically where things start, uh, start to go wrong. First of all, um, we've got an um, ecosystem that only consists of digital transactions. And I wrote a book last year together with Victor Broers um, on um, what would happen in a world where you have only payments in uh, digital and somebody starts to mess around with the data because at the end of the day how much money you earn is only a number in a computer. That's the end of it. There's nothing more, nothing less. It's basically a number. So if somebody writes some kind of malware that represents that some people have a lot more money the next morning than the day before, let's say like five million, you get an interesting um, scenario. You get a scenario where you have um, a money printing, but you haven't got no clue how much money you're printing. And this is typically something that is not being valued. Actually, when we introduced the book, um, the Dutch um, uh, National Bank that um, uh, oversees all the money transactions refused to come and uh, enter into a debate. But then SWIFT was hacked two times. And strangely enough, all of a sudden they got interested and we started in the conversation and people were interested in um, why do you write this scenario and, and why is it that um, you are so worried about this? And the whole, th the whole thing in the information society is that we don't think about these issues beforehand. Actually, we don't take any real measures to prevent misery from happening. And this is what we have seen before. And now this is where boats come in. Um, I have written down a couple of examples of huge disasters um, that happened with boats. In 1120 there was this uh, white ship that um, got caught up in a storm and um, went down and 300 people died. One of them was an heir to the throne and for 20 years there was a lot of um, discussion and fights over who should be on the throne now. And nobody realized that this was a big thing. In 1274 and 1281, more than 100,000 people died. And remember, read the year again and remember how many people were on the planet back then. That's a lot less than now. And 100,000 plus people died. And we said, oh, okay. 
and again it was in a storm. In the years thereafter there were a lot of disasters where a lot of ships went down and most of the times there were two words that were relevant, the Brits and the storm. And that seems to be uh, something consistent all the time. Now what makes this interesting is that um, after the storms um, we also had a new development, a new technology um, called the steamboat. Today especially popular since um, St. Nicholas is coming to the Netherlands again, uh, always on the steamboat. But the interesting part is he has done that many times without any traffic rules. We didn't know whether to sail on the left side or on the right side, so a lot of ships ended up in collisions. And then there was this international conference in 1889 uh, for three months where they discussed basic rules to work on ships because everybody saw this was an issue. A lot of people are dying, a lot of ships sink because they were not properly built, there are a lot of storms, there are a lot of issues all the time coming back that, um, that hit us. And then the Brits said no. So there was no international treaty. Well, if we look at ICT, it's basically the same story. We know there are a lot of issues. We know we've got a lot of incidents and we know we built poor software. We, we built dramatically poor software. So we've got data leaks all the time. With the, I think the, one of the saddest is the, the lower one, Yahoo, with 500 million records. Currently being, um, um, so Yahoo is currently being sold to Verizon and um, their worth, net worth would be 4.3, a little bit of 4.3 billion dollars. And what will um, Verizon get is 500 million customers. Now if you go on the, onto the dark web you can buy this database for a little over 1800 dollars. So the damage here is fairly clear. Now, if we look at, and I've shown this one um, often before, if we look at a lot of organizations and how they deal with security, um, you see the same issue everywhere. Since you're technical, I don't have to explain that an, R, uh, that an XSS leak is an issue. You can, of course, uh, craft an attack where you can um, uh, seduce people to come to your site or actually to the bank site, and then, uh, of course, steal money. So. Let's see how the Dutch banks do in general. And I don't have to explain that everything you have you see moving is basically in an, an XSS leak. One year later, this is the picture. <laughs> well, I guess you get the issue. The thing is that um, one year later, and basically this one was really one setting to change and apparently that hasn't been done. And the interesting one was ABN Amaro because they couldn't fix it for months because they, had, um, um, they were depending on their suppliers. So apparently they had so little control over their entire environment that they couldn't fix this for two months. <coughs> This is the state where we currently are in um, information technology. And if you, with me, would accept that we live in an information society and the, um, uh, the industrial era is over and we are really in an information era, this is totally unacceptable, totally, um, uh, totally incomprehensible as well. Also, um, if you look at what goes wrong, um, everybody knows the OWASP top, top 10. Well, it's still, you know, the number one data leak is so easy to prevent, so easy to, um, uh, to overcome. And what happens basically, it's still the number one attack. So apparently we are really poor in learning. It is basically, this is what I would call the, the storm in sailing. Well, 
if you look at the OAuth uh, slide, and I deliberately stole those, um, then you see the only thing changing is basically the top 10. So every three, three years we get a new top 10 and we say like, okay, this is the way that um, we get hacked all the time. Well, then came the Titanic in sailing. And uh, one of the interesting things was, um, can, by the way, anybody um, explain to me what happened to the Titanic? It sank, but why? crashed on an iceberg, but then later on we found out that crashing on the iceberg was not basically enough to make the ship sink. In 2008 we discovered that also the, there was a, an, an error in the construction, because only four rooms um, were hit by the iceberg and were full of water, and because of the construction error there was a fifth room, and that was a little bit too much, and that made the ship sink. But that shouldn't be a problem, because over the last three years, We've had three incidents of ships um, running into icebergs that hardly made news. Why? Well, they did sink, but um, everybody was salvaged. We were able to call help, but um, Titanic called help. But the interesting part, the thing was, um, look at the antennas. They had, they had perfect radio equipment for that era. The thing was that the ship nearby, the SS California, um, the, the one who was responsible for the radio communications went to bed 10 minutes before they sent out the emergency, they found out. Why? Because nobody had the rule that you had to watch the radio all the time. N it was not uh, obliged. And when they saw fire, uh, the fireworks, they went like, oh, interesting, nice. And by the time they realized this might be a ship in, in peril, um, the lights had, had basically uh, gone out, so they thought, okay, the ship must have, you know, passed on, but basically it just sank. So it never realized, and then there was a lack, other ships, by the way, were coming to help, there was a lack of um, boat rescue boats, um, because there wasn't an international treaty. So the Brits had the rule, either you have a rescue boat, or you have life vests. So what did they do on the Titanic? They had, had partially life vests and partially um, salvage boats. And the other ones were taken off because that's aesthetically it's a lot nicer if you don't have all these boats on the side. You know how OWASP follows up this slide? 80% is the iceberg underwater and that's libraries and that's what we have, be care uh, have to be careful for. You know, and with icebergs, in 1912 we learned one thing. You fly around and you map them. As of 1914, every day, icebergs are being mapped. In ICT, still we don't. And after the disaster, we got the treaty SOLA, safety of life at sea. Now we say, like, okay, if you're a big boat, you have to have um, selfish boats. If you're a smaller boat, like my boat, and you are able to go quicker than 20 kilometers per hour, you have to have life vest, period. For each person present, you have to have it. And if you have a radio on board, like I do, you have to turn it on. Even though that sometimes my wife says, can't you turn it off because it's so noisy? Unfortunately, you can't. You can, of course, put it in your ear, and um, that's basically what I do now. But you have to listen, because if nobody listens when I'm in peril, that doesn't work. Strangely enough, this is not present for software. We have standards, we have loads of open standards to deliver high quality software and we don't. And there is another interesting thing, does anybody know this ship? Uh, who, who was saying that? Yeah, perfect. You know why it sank? Yes, um, this ship was not supposed to sail to Zeebrugge actually, but uh, they placed it there because the other ship was out of service. And then um, they had two decks for the cars to go on, and what do you do if you want the ship to be lower? You fill it up with water, that's normal procedure, so the ship lowers a little bit. Then indeed, exactly happened what you said, um, they were in a hurry. So they Clo they basically closed up and they forgot to close these doors. 
Then it started sailing, and then there was this little, little unfortunate thing. Um, it's same like the Dutch IJsselmeer. Zeebrugge is highly undeep. The, the water is really, um, uh, there's not an, a lot of water underneath the ship. So what happens if you start sailing at speed, and that's what they did. They weren't speeding, but they were uh, sailing at maximum speeds of 80 knots. You know, you get a lot of water inside the ship. And within 19 sec uh, nine, uh, sorry, 90 seconds, the ship flipped over and it landed on the sandbank. That was a little bit um, lucky. Unlucky was that the captain never sent out a mayday call for the simple reason that he fell over and he was knocked out. A lot of bad luck. Now, if you know so much about this ship, sir, tell me, what was the incident with Swift? What was the technical reason that Swift got hacked? It's not related to the ship. Sorry? Not related to the ship. Not related to the ship, no, but um, why was Swift hacked? The captain of <laughs> Well, the funny thing is we don't know. And this is the whole point I'm trying to make. Because we're not open. If you're at sea, you are open and you have what you call an investigative board that investigates incidents. We've got one ICT incident ever investigated uh, in the entire world. One hack, does anybody know which hack? Yeah, did you know that in the Netherlands? And that's the only one they, we have publicly investigated. All the other ones are secret. How, how much bigger than Swift would you like to have hacks? Do we know what happens to Yahoo? No, we don't. So there are a lot of incidents where we've got no clue what happens. Um, in sailing, I'm all the time transparent. This is my boat and you can look it up where it is right now. Um, because I have a transponder on, uh, on my ship. And of course that is in one sense a privacy violation, but the advantage is that I can see other ships and I can now calculate. So if I'm coming from this side, wanting to cross, I can't physically see the ship, but on my system I see it, so I lower my speed. And you prevent a lot of difficult situations. Strangely enough, we all work with closed source most of the time and we think it's totally normal that we have like totally non-controlled systems that we start to rely on every day. Volkswagen learned us in a hard way that basically the, the era of not seeing the source code is over. You can't measure cars properly enough to make sure that um, there isn't like any backdoor in the software or any other system Without open, basically, there's no point in ever going, um, you know, in ever using systems and fully rely on this. This is especially unfortunate right now when everybody is up in the arms about Donald Trump. But as Snowden said last week, Trump is not the issue. The issue is that we have got an infrastructure of unreliable software that can now be used at everybody at, uh, um, at everybody's, um, um, sorry, an in infrastructure that can now be abused by everybody who wants to, who's in power. And in the US we know one thing for certain, um, uh, a regime doesn't last any longer than eight years. So you get a regime change all the time. So how can you be amazed by Donald Trump? It's beside the point. The point is that we've got a bad infrastructure. And we are always secretive on what happens. And the funny thing is, when something goes awry at sea, this is what we get. Now, here's something interesting as well. The Estonia is going down, and at a certain point, um, they call for help, and they call for, uh, for help from their direct competitor. That is a ship filled with people on a tight schedule. Now, you heard Mariella responding to the Mayday call. 
What do you think the captain said? A. I'm busy. B. I'm coming to help. B. It's required by law. Why on earth don't we do the same in ICT? Why do, on earth do we still act secretly and don't um, start to help each other? Why do we still try to compete on um, security when you don't want to? This is a story about a small hack, not really um, that big, um, with the local municipality of Ada. And they did an investigation and they've written that they um, think that the report should be secret. So they, wrote, they crafted it in such a way that you cannot ask for it under the Freedom of Information Act. So they wrote down a report to ensure that it will be classified. And the politicians sanctioned it. Well, the interesting part is that probably we won't know what happened there. And we will never take, relearn. But the stupid thing is that at the end of the day, um, you, never, um, you never get away with it. Do you know this hacker? Anybody? Yeah, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. He was nine years old when he heard this music that was closed source. The Miserere by Allegri. And the Pope decided that it is not allowed to um, perform this music without his permission. So everything was secret. Yet Mozart came back to his room that same night and wrote down all the music and all the text because of his memory. You can't keep things closed and nothing will remain closed. And since it's in Dutch, um, most, um, you know, over the last couple of years we've seen so many disclosures that keeping things silent is really not the way to go. Another municipality had, um, had uh, an, a small incident, they kept it silent. And you see on the right hand side here, and for the other ones here, a, a quarter of all the articles that have, be, that have been written about it. On one side. So keeping silent is maybe not the best way to go. I, recollect um, Cloudflare that was hacked, where Cloudflare wrote an exact timeline of what happened. And the interesting one, uh, thing is that they wrote a blog about it. The second post intrigued me the most. One of the mistakes they made was that they used Google services and didn't uh, they only used username and password. Well, it's possible to get a short message on your phone and you have to enter that as well as an added layer of security. Now we might think a lot about that, but the thing is that the second comment was, I didn't know that was possible, I'll start to use that immediately. So sharing the information actually makes a lot of people safer. You know who is sharing? That are the criminals. This is a part of an email that has been sent to hacking team. And the interesting point is this one. Point eight, you promise not to report this zero day to vendor or disclose it before the patch. Because the entire business model is related to keeping things secret. Now the Dutch government is currently on its way to um, use zero days to let the police hack. And they need that, so they say like sometimes we need to keep a, a leak to ourselves. Now if you know that we're in a world where um, IoT devices are dropped on the market by the thousands, by the millions, a zero day leaving that out there is extremely dangerous. Because you can start attacks in a way that, you know, um, we only start to understand now how bad that can be. So apparently this, in my vision, it's not the best way to go. Then you always end up in the discussion, yeah, but if you disclose it, the police can't hack. Well, I'm really, when I'm sailing, I'm really interested in rescue. And I think that um, in the Netherlands, the, the people who voluntarily pull people out of the water are true heroes. Yet I think it's far more interesting to make them unemployed as much as possible. 
and have to have as little incidents as possible. So the real choice is not about can the police do their job once something went wrong. Now, can we get to a situation where we need a lot less policing because we are in a better place? So the question between transparency and non-transparency, in my opinion, is really a choice between do you want to wait for the incident and then try to catch the criminal, or do we want to prevent the incident? That's the choice we're facing. Thank you. So, my message is, let's go on to the Titanic. And I've got no clue what the Titanic will be, because after twice Swift, I thought, well, how much bigger do we need incidents after Yahoo? How much bigger do we need incidents? But maybe I, the, the thing with the Titanic was, was not that it was such a big incident. Maybe 1,500 deaths on, on the total scale wasn't that big. The interesting part was it was a ship that sailed for the first time, deemed unsinkable, and it was because it was the maiden voyage, filled with people who, are very, who were very well known. And that made the impact in society. So it's very hard to say what will be the Titanic. Well, there's just one thing I need to finish on. This is the same lock after the, the, we were dealt with. Now the thing was, it was maintained from a distance. So as soon as we were in, the system locked. Because it was a remote controlled window system. And we had to wait for three and a half hours, nearly four, for somebody to get in a car and reset the Windows computer by hand. So much for technology. At that point, um, we were so late that we wouldn't probably reach the place we re really wanted to, to go to and where we had a hotel booked. So my wife said, step on it. Now, if you have a security mindset and you have a open mindset, you can also look for different solutions. My solution was not to do that, but to call Lelystad and said like, okay, now we're faced with the problem that basically you created for using Windows. Fix it, please. And what they did was they um, measured where we were and then of, because of my transmitter, and opened all the um, uh, bridges that needed to be opened, all two of them, and made sure that we could get into the next lock immediately. For the final lock that was out of, outside their control, they made a phone call and it was open for 30 minutes longer. I could have selected to do the wrong thing. I would not have done that. In that case, I would just have picked a hotel somewhere else and, you know, accept the situation. But this is basically what we have to learn in the information society, is to consistently make the choices that are sometimes hard to make, even when it hurts. Now, to eat my own shit, this is one of the last presentations where you will see my Mac, because I'm going back to Linux, and I've just ordered... I've just ordered... my next laptop, because now what we know from Snowden and what we have learned uh, on uh, compromised systems, there's, uh, to, fight against, um, to fight against all these types of hacks, all these types of espionage, only you know, making the right choices is the thing that can help. Well, thank you.